Uh, thank you, Reverend Loya, for the introduction. Thank you to Dr. Lindenmeyer for the invitation to come and speak here. Uh, earlier this afternoon, I had the pleasure of speaking with some of you uh, at uh, Dr. Hartnett's uh, class, uh, at which I tried to explain why did Americans so badly misunderstand the revolutions of February and October 1917, and I tried to explain that by going back to the 1880s and looking at the development of American thinking about Russia and its revolutionary movement in that period. In this lecture, I'd like to go f mostly forward from 1917 to the present uh, and uh, to try to address a couple of questions. Uh, as uh, Reverend Loya has indicated, I want to focus uh, first on the question of Americanization, and then I want to address uh, memories, images, and identities to try to open up some new perspectives, open up a new thinking about the periodization of Russian-American relations, and ultimately try to get at the question of why uh, have America and Russia been locked in a kind of uh, embrace that doesn't do any co either country any good, an embrace in which uh, Russia is central to how Americans think about who we are, and America is central to how Russians think about who they are. Uh, so I want to tr try to tease that out. That's the ultimate significance of what I try to get at today, an explanation. So you have here a brief outline that's on your paper handout, and then you see on the back of the, uh, uh, of the outline one of the images that I'm going to show you. Uh, images are central to this presentation, so those of you who are at the far end I think are dis disadvantaged and may want to slide over this way for a better view if you, if you, if you can. Americanization. <clears throat> Russia is a very different country from the United States. And yet, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, many Americans came to believe that Russia and America were uh, actually under the skin very much alike. So there's a period before the 1880s where many Americans were inclined to say, well, Russia is very different from the United States. They have a different religious tradition. They have a very different history. Fine, let them be them, and we'll be us, and we can each move forward in our own ways. In the late 19th century and the early 20th century, Americans increasingly came to believe that Russia's destiny was to be remade in the image of the United States economically, culturally, politically, religiously. And so that's what I want to get at in the starting point. Where did this idea come from? Start, start with the economic dimension. Uh, in the uh, late 19th century, the McCormick Harvesting Company, later known as International Harvester, uh, was producing lots of uh, reaping and threshing machines and finding in Russia which is a great agricultural exporter in the 19th century, finding in Russia a vast market for American agricultural machinery. Here's an image from the time, conveying, I think, a notion that became increasingly widespread that in exporting harvesting machines and threshers, reapers to Russia, the United States was not just contributing to the economic development of Russia, but as the glow of this image, I think, suggests, not just modernizing, but uplifting uh, Russia. So the McCormick at work in Asiatic Russia. McCormick was not the only American company finding a big market uh, in Tsarist Russia in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Singer sewing machines. Uh, very popular in uh, uh, um, the rural Russia. Many rural women taking up uh, handicrafts in the home using the Singer sewing machine. Again, the sense of uh, transformation, but with the implication that this involves a kind of uplift as well as economic modernization. If you go back and you read <clears throat> newspapers in Tsarist Russia in the early 20th century, you'll find advertised there <clears throat> uh, Deering harvesting machines. Russians at the time could also take photographs with Kodak cameras. They could shave in the morning with Gillette razors. 
So this is part of a process that was not just targeted at Russia, but targeted at, at many European countries, the export of American surplus production, American manufacturers finding markets overseas for what they could not consume inside the United States. Well, what are the implications of that? For George F. Kennan, as uh, many of you know, a vitally important, maybe the single most important diplomat for understanding Soviet-American relations in the middle and later 20th century. George F. Kennan, after he left the United States government and became a scholar, worked at the Institute for Advanced Study, wrote books, endeavored to develop a historical perspective. George F. Kennan developed the perspective that what was happening in late Tsarist Russia was the modernization of an agrarian society, the modernization of Russia, and involved in that for Kennan was, up until 1914, that was a hopeful course of development. That it was contributing not just to the modernization, but to the stabilization of Russia, that what Russia would move beyond the troubles that it had experienced, for example, at the time of the Russo-Japanese War and the First Revolution of 1905, that Russia would gradually move beyond that. If only Russia had not become involved in the great Western European conflict of the First World War. So here's a notion that Russia is off on the eastern end of the continent. Unfortunately, Russia gets sucked into the First World War because of its alliance with France. And as a result, the adjustment of Russia's uh, political, economic, social system to modern times is disrupted by the war. This plays a leading part in bringing on the revolution. Then with the revolution, as Kennan argued in a different book, a group of fanatics, ideological fanatics, the Bolsheviks seize power. They never would have been able to seize power without the First World War. They're able to seize power because of it. And these are fanatics who are profoundly and incurably hostile to Western ideals, Kennan argues. <coughs> this is important for Kennan in telling the story then of the origins of Soviet American antagonism in the Cold War by saying that a group of fanatics who are ideologically predisposed to hostility to America and the rest of the Western capitalist world, they have seized power and taken Russia on a different course. Before Russia was on a promising course of development, then a nightmare, a disastrous course of development with anti-American Bolsheviks in power. So the implicit in this is the notion that 1917, the October Revolution of 1917, marks a tremendous rupture, a break in the history of Russian-American relations. Things could have developed differently if uh, the uh, Bolsheviks had never come to power. One of the things that the Bolsheviks do right uh, in 1917, 1918, 1919 is to begin the process of nationalizing the assets of foreign companies including eventually by 1920 major American companies, including Singer and International Harvester. Therefore, there was a promising course of development, then there's a rupture and a break, and Russia goes off on a different course that is profoundly anti-Western and anti-American. That's one perspective. What I want to suggest to you here at the outset is a different way of looking at uh, October 7, 1917 in relationship to the rest of the 20th century. <clears throat> in the spring of 1918, so just a few months after the Bolsheviks have seized power in October 1917 in Russia, in the spring of 1918, uh, Lenin, the number one Bolshevik leader, met with an American named Rabin Robbins, the head of an American Red Cross mission that had been serving in Russia. And Lenin and Robbins agreed on a draft of a plan for Soviet-American trade. With all that Lenin had on his plate at that moment, the conclusion of the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk with Germany in March of 1918, the looming development of a civil war between white and red, with all of the things that Lenin on his, had on his plate, I think it's very interesting that he made time to work with economic advisors to develop a draft plan for Soviet-American trade in the spring of 1918. Why did he attach high priority to that? For Lenin, 
America was, among other things, the most advanced of the capitalist powers. If Soviet Russia was going to turn to capitalist powers for the technology needed for the development of Soviet socialism, they would love to turn above all to the most advanced of the capitalist powers. This is what Lenin has in mind. Uh, uh, somewhat later in 1918, Lenin uh, scribbles out a definition of socialism. Interestingly, that definition of socialism is Soviet power plus Prussian efficiency on the railroads plus American technology and America's organization of trusts. In other words, even though trusts are bad things if they're under capitalist oppressors, they're a good thing in terms of efficient large-scale organization of industries if you have Soviet power plus American public education that's something to admire and something the Soviets will push in the 1920s with a, uh, an ambitious literacy campaign to make all Soviets literate. John Dewey becomes a popular figure in Soviet education in the 1920s. In other words, his vision of socialism hinges on openness to American influences, borrowing from American influences, incorporating American technology to build the kind of advanced urban industrial Soviet socialist paradise that he has in, that he has in mind. So in contrast to the notion that the Bolsheviks who seized power were simply and fundamentally anti-American and anti-Western, I think it's important to note at the outset that Lenin and other Bolshevik leaders make it a high priority to have an economic relationship, hopefully also diplomatic relations and other forms of relationship, uh, educational exchange, in, uh, uh, intellectual exchange with the Americans. And Lenin goes on from that. So it's not just a dream. It's not just something he scribbles on a piece of paper, but he takes a series of actions. He invites Americans, uh, American financiers, American engineers to come in and participate in Soviet industrialization. Like what? The future American ambassador, Averill Harriman, who'll be ambassador during the Second World War, is one of those who takes a concession that is an opportunity to participate in financing uh, industrial development in manganese mines down, down in the south uh, of Soviet Russia. So Harriman is one of those who Lenin wants to lure into participating in Soviet industrialization. Uh, 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 Lenin and then his uh, successor, Stalin, push the development of Soviet uh, hydroelectric power by borrowing on the precedent of American building of dams. And in fact, it is an American engineer, Hugh Cooper, who comes over and is key to the building of dams on, on, uh, on Soviet rivers, which is the backdrop of the image that you have here uh, with uh, a dam in the background, as Lenin says, out of uh, uh, NEP era, N new economic policy era Russia, will come a socialist Russia. So Lenin's vision involves not Russia going its own way separate from the West, but a deep a connection to the West and particularly, he hopes, to the United States in order to get the benefit of American technological expertise, American engineering knowledge, American finance. This is a, a, a different kind of vision, I think, from what Kennan recognized in his perspective. Now, one of the things that I was able to do when I was on sabbatical leave last year was to read a bunch of magazines. I was able to go through every single issue of the illustrated Soviet magazine called Crocodile, Crocodile, which is published by the same publishing house as Pravda, a Communist Party newspaper. So when you're looking at Crocodile, you are looking at the official Communist Party line distributed in an illustrated form to a mass audience, hundreds of thousands of copies of the magazine inside Soviet Russia. And I was able to look through every single issue, every single image, and found a number of images of America in the Communist Party Illustrated magazine. Well, what do you think this image shows? Some of you are close enough, and some of you have very good vision, no doubt. Let's see what you, let's see what you can make out. Shiny red car. Who's the driver? Any idea what kind of a car that is? That's Henry Ford. That's, that's Henry Ford. 
capitalists are almost never depicted positively in communist propaganda. Communists, capitalists are the enemy. Capitalists are usually in big boulder hats and they're smoking a stogie pipe and they're fat and ugly. That's how capitalists are usually represented. But America is different. And Henry Ford, the guy that came up with the mass production system, mass production of automobiles in the United States, Henry Ford is different. So central to the Soviet vision, this is 1929, central to the Soviet vision of industrialization in the first five-year plan in the Soviet Union is the use of American technology. So it's not just a dream, it's not just a vision, it's not just something that Lenin scribbles on a piece of paper, it is central to the process of Soviet industrialization. Lenin envisioned it, Stalin carries it out in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Here, the Soviet worker, you see him there with his uh, worker's cap, the Soviet worker comes up to Henry Ford and says to him, uh, Mr. Ford, take me to Nizhny. Take me to Nizhny Novgorod, where Ford has agreed to participate in the construction of a Soviet automobile plant. So the meaning of the image is that the shiny red car, and you know red is the color symbolizing socialism, communism, right? The shiny red car is going to drive to the future and the worker will be driven there by Henry Ford symbolizing American technology. This is an, you won't find positive images of French or British capitalists, but you do find here, he, he even looks handsome, friendly. Henry Ford produced not only automobiles, you know, the Ford Model A or Ford Model T, Ford also produced tractors. And there was a big Stalingrad tractor factory constructed with the assistance of the Ford company. Here, the red tractor is key to the whole project of Soviet modernization. It's going to dispel the superstitious Russian Orthodox church influence of the past. That's going to be pushed aside as Soviet Russia moves towards an atheist, secular vision of modernity. Uh, the, the, the priest is going to be pushed aside. The monarchs are going to be pushed aside. We're going to move forward to a dreamy future, and we're going to be carried there on the wheels of shiny red cars and uh, powerful red tractors. So we're going to move towards communism through Fordson tractors. Any questions so far? Well, wait a minute. There's another side to the story. Precisely because Soviet Russia was borrowing so much from the United States. 1929 to 1932, the, the 1933, the, year, the years of the first five-year plan are the years when the largest number of Americans come to Soviet Russia as engineers, but also to see as the United States has sunk into the Great Depression after the stock market crash of 1929, Americans are also thronging to Soviet Russia to see what's going on there as they are modernizing and industrializing while the capitalist West is sinking into a Great Depression. So at the very time that there is the biggest influence of American technology and American ideas, the largest number of Americans is coming into Soviet Russia, at the very time it becomes more important for Soviet propagandists to stress the other side of America. And what would you stress that is so negative about America? Well, let's see what you make out uh, from this image. Out of all the bad things that you could say about the United States, what does this Soviet propagandist want to focus attention on? Patrick. Maltreatment of African Americans. That's clearly central with the figure here who is lynched. So actually lynching is starting to wane a bit by the 1930s. The peak had come earlier in the 20th century, but lynching and more broadly racial discrimination, racial segregation, targeting African-Americans becomes a centerpiece of Soviet propaganda. 
But you also find cent central to the Soviet propaganda against the United States another element, which is what? You, you see the, the, the Christian imagery. So Soviet atheism is being contrasted to American Christianity. Religion is superstition. Religion is the opiate of the masses. Religion is destined to be buried as we move forward to a, a modern atheistic secular culture. So the, the negative images of America you can also find. Okay, so here's, here's, the, here's the capitalist who I mentioned before, right? The contrast to Henry, For Henry Ford's image. The, so you can also talk about capitalist exploitation, plutocracy, but featured here uh, religion and uh, um, uh, racism as central. So anti-Americanism is the counterpoint to uh, Americanism, the Soviet word for admiration of a certain kind of American spirit. Americanism in the Soviet uh, uh, language is Americans have an energy, a drive, a discipline, an efficiency, a pep that we want in our modern energetic Soviet Russia. <coughs> so at the same time as you're borrowing, then you also want to vilify them. Why? Why would it be so important? On the one hand, we love having their Ford automobiles and their Ford tractors. Why would it be so important at the same time to depict them negatively? greatest nation. They want socialism to be seen as clearly superior to capitalism. Soviet socialism to be superior to American capitalism. Soviet socialism is offering a better road to a modern future for the world's peoples. Not just for the Soviet Union itself, but in order to propagandize on behalf of communism for the future, to go around the world and say, we're able to move towards modernity faster than if you follow the corrupt exploitative, racist, bigoted American model. Yes? Yeah, I think it's supposed to be religious imagery, but I guess it could be interpreted like a, like a swastika. Uh, this is 1930, so it's before Hitler comes into power in, in January of 33. But yeah, it could, it could be an illusion. Yeah. What else is interesting from this period? Well, here's the image that was used in the uh, publicity for this, uh, for this lecture. What's so important about this period of time in setting ideas that would last for the next 50, 60 years? Here's a race. America is in the lead. You see the stars and stripes here? America is in the lead in the race. And then behind America, the British, the French, uh, the Germans, I think, are running a race. And who's the young guy in the back? Who's the young guy in the back? This is the Soviet Union with the star. That's the Soviet Union in the back. So they're acknowledging, right now, we're last in the race. We're behind. We're still backwards. Stalin says, we have to make up the distance between us and the capitalist powers very quickly because there's a new war coming and we have to be ready for that. And how are we going to be ready for that? Because we're going to modernize very rapidly. So Stalin talks about that in terms of it's, it's urgent. But the cartoon suggests this guy is not even breathing hard. He's just, yeah, I'm going to win this race. No problem. I'm young. I'm fit. I'm just cruising along, and when I get to that last quarter mile, I'm going to dust these dudes. <laughs> because look at them. They're straining, they're sweating, they're old men. So here is a vision of catching up to and surpassing the most advanced of the capitalist countries, dognat i perignat, which will be a cardinal theme in Soviet propaganda for decades. We have the ambition to catch up to the most advanced capitalist powers and leave them behind. Ten years later, same vision. 
America's in the lead, but America is so overweight, out of shape, that there's no question that the Soviet athlete is going to catch America eventually and outstrip them. And Europe is in even worse shape than America is. So here's a hallmark. Now, I say for decades thereafter. So let's jump forward in time. Now we're in December 1958. Here's a different kind of a race. There's America, USA, on the milk pails, the large milk pails. Uh, CCCP, you know, of course, means USSR. Soviet Union at the bottom, the Soviet milkmaid here. What's this a reference to? December 1958. So here we've jumped ahead from the late 20s to the late 1950s. What is the parallel here? Khrushchev, the Soviet leader by that time, Stalin dies in 1953, Khrushchev denounces him in 1956. Now Khrushchev is the leader, but there's the same basic vision. Khrushchev predicts in the late 1950s, by 1980, the Soviet Union will produce more meat and milk per capita than even the rich Americans do. Therefore, Soviet citizens will have a higher standard of living than the Americans do. So confidence that we're going to, so America is still the benchmark. America is still the point of comparison. Do you see that point? So America, even as, whether it is as uh, um, um, dark double or um, uh, the, uh, our competitor in a race, America is either way the standard of comparison for affirming Soviet superiority, either now in terms of having eliminated racism, supposedly, either now superior in a moral sense, or superior in the future in terms of leaving capitalism in the dust. So Khrushchev had a way of saying this. He said, uh, <clears throat> our train will go ahead of your train. And then from the caboose, a wave bye-bye <laughs> from the back of the bus. So the famous saying that people, people often misquote, about uh, we're going to bury you. You've heard Khrushchev uh, saying, we're going to bury you. That's what Khrushchev had in mind. Not that we're going to bomb you and you're going to be buried under radioactive dust, but we're going to leave you in the dust in the sense of, bye-bye, we're out, we're out of here, and you're left behind in the race between the socialist and capitalist systems. Questions? Yes? Uh, Khrushchev uh, was aware of the heartland of America being a uh, major, major agricultural area. And the following year, September 1959, Khrushchev would actually make a point of coming to Iowa, uh, going to uh, Roswell Garst's, if I remember the name correctly, Roswell Garst's oh, farm Garst, yeah. in Iowa. And he had some, I think he had had some contact with Garst prior to the visit to the United States in 1959. So that's the context of Iowa. So uh, Khrushchev becomes known as uh, Kukuruznik because he gets a fascination with corn production. Or to give you another example, Khrushchev comes out to the area where I'm from, California. He visits an IBM plant in 1959, International Business Machines plant. He goes to the cafeteria. He sees, wow, look at what an efficient way the Americans have of serving in a cafeteria. Uh, you don't wait for somebody to serve you. You go up with your own tray and you go down the line and you get what you need. And you so Khrushchev comes back from the United States and says, all Soviet cafeterias will be like the IBM cafeteria. So you see the point I'm making? Emulation, imitation, acknowledgement that America is superior to model to be copied, but confidence that eventually in the future we will be superior. Now let's jump ahead a little further. <clears throat> in 1959, it was possible for the Soviet cartoonists to be confident that in the chess match between socialism and capitalism, socialism would prove superior. Here, the chess pieces are, uh, these are cows. So it's the same sort of notion. We're going to produce more meat and milk than the Americans do, and the capitalists are going to lose out in that competition. That's 1959. In 1959, there were plenty of Americans who worried 
that America was losing the Cold War. The Soviets put Sputnik into, fa into space before, before the Americans did. Soviets had cosmonauts in space before we had astronauts in space. There was a lot of worry in the late 1950s that, by God, we might lose the Cold War struggle. So it's, it's not completely delusional at a time when the Soviet economy was growing 7 or 8 percent per year faster than the American economy was growing, for Khrushchev to think and for the Soviet propagandists to think Soviet Union will win the chess match between socialism and capitalism. But by 1991, this is even before the dis disintegration of the Soviet Union, this is November 1991, <clears throat> the figure here dressed like a Western businessman is playing a game of chess against, you know who that is? Karl Marx, the, f the founder of communist ideology, Karl Marx. Uh, <clears throat> he says, you lost. You lose, <coughs> citizen Marx, in the chess match between communism and capitalism. And why do they lose? Because the uh, businessman, the capitalist, is producing more computers, more kolbasa, more sausages. So Khrushchev's vision does not materialize. And in fact, by 1991, uh, Soviet citizens are coming to sense the superiority of uh, the productivity of Western capitalism and the greater desirability of Western consumer culture. So there's a story that I've told about um, Americanization. And I've tried to suggest to you that in contrast to the idea that the Bolsheviks seize power and they want to take Soviet socialism on a completely different course, cut off contact with the West, pursue socialism in one country as if they're retreating back into the darkness of their own uh, cave, in contrast, I'm suggesting that the development of a socialist uh, Soviet country hinges to a great extent upon borrowing from American technology, contact with American ideas, and eagerness for exchange at the same time as there is a criticism of America for its racism, for its bigotry, for its religious superstition, and so on and so forth. Either way, America and Soviet Russia are not simply polar opposites. You know, it's typical to say there's Wilsonianism and Leninism. There's Americanism and Sovietism, as if they're polar opposites and they have nothing to do with each other. And what I've tried to suggest here in the first part of the lecture is that actually when you look at it, Soviet socialism and Americanism are integrally connected in the way that Soviet socialism develops through influence from America. And America is the ideal to be caught and surpassed is therefore integral to the construction of a so Soviet Russia. Uh, a mistake, perhaps, for the Soviets to put the grounds for the superiority of cap capitalism on purely materialistic basis, where they lose out. You know, one might have argued in the 1920s for a different kind of definition of how Soviet communism was going to be superior. We're going to build a new Soviet man. We're going to build a new kind of humanity that will be spiritually superior, more collectivist in orientation, more self-sacrificing instead of individualistic and greedy. You could have put the case that way. But by the time of Khrushchev, as you see, the, the bottom line standard of evaluation is who's superior? It's based on who puts more sausage and milk on the table. Very materialistic explanation. Okay, so that's the first part of what I wanted to do. Second part, I want to turn more to a foreign policy question. So if the first part is about images and identity and vision of the future, the second part I want to turn more to something that was actually done in terms of foreign policy and military interaction, and that is U.S. intervention in the Russian Civil War. Now you notice I used <clears throat> George F. Kennan as a foil in the first part of the lecture. Now I'm going to use George F. Kennan as a foil for the second part of the lecture. Beat up on him again. <laughs> After Kennan left the diplomatic service, becomes a historian, he writes two magnificent prize-winning volumes on Soviet-American relations. He says 1917, 1920, he actually only got to 1918, hundreds and hundreds of pages, and he only gets it, but it's richly detailed. But it tells a story that I think is wrong. Uh, intervention in the Russian Civil War, in his view, means 
we sent a small military expedition into northern Russia, and we sent a small military expedition into eastern Siberia, and that's basically it. That's, that's what we did, did to intervene in the Russian Civil War. Those expeditions were not really connected to ideology. They were sideshows of the First World War. They were sent there because of considerations related to the war against Germany. We didn't want Germany to get a submarine base in the north of Russia at Arkhangelsk. We didn't want the Germans or their allies to capture stockpiles of ammunition and weapons that the, the British and the French and the Americans had sent to Russia when it was under the Tsarist government and under the provisional government of 1917. So that's basically the expo explanation that Kennan argues. Uh, it's not about ideology. We're, we were not trying to overthrow the Soviet government. That's basically his explanation. I've been disturbed to find that that old interpretation from the 1950s continues to be presented by distinguished scholars in the present day. So Laura Engelstein, a distinguished historian, used to teach at Princeton and at Yale, has come out with a new book, Russia in Flames, where she essentially reiterates the views of scholars like George F. Kennan and Betty Unterberger from the 1950s, arguing that Woodrow Wilson was not hostile to the Bolshevik government. We know he wasn't hostile because he said friendly things or friendly sounding things about the Soviet government in 1918. And he firmly rejected the idea of trying to influence in any way the post-revolutionary government in Russia. I think, again, this is profoundly wrong. And it uh, leaves out an ideological dimension that is very important for thinking about the course of the 20th century. In January 1918, if you look at the image on the left, Woodrow Wilson delivered his 14 points address. His vision of the post-war world, an idealistic set of principles, open covenants openly arrived at, freedom of the seas, self-determination for all nations, idealistic principles that Wilson s suggests should not be just the principles for America, but for the whole of the world. Our flag is the flag of humanity. That's a universalism. That's an idealistic form of universalism. Our vision should be manifest everywhere around the world. Wilsonian uh, idealism. The following year, the Soviets create the Communist International, or Comintern for short, which has its own vision of the future of the world, revolving around the extension of Soviet principles, Soviet ideals, a communism around the world, not just in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, but spreading, you notice in particular, to areas of the British Empire, Britain as a particular target, thinking about Egypt, thinking about uh, India, thinking about the British presence in China, uh, that those are going to be areas that will come under communist control. So my point is here, uh, Kennan was right that there were some concerns about Germany in 1918, but there's also a very strong ideological antagonism between a Wilsonian universalism and a Leninist universalism, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. Then. It's wrong, I think, to say intervention only consisted of the small military interventions in northern Russia and eastern Siberia, because intervention actually involved a number of other ways of trying to influence the course of the Russian Civil War. So in the book, the first book that I wrote that Father Loya mentioned in his introduction, America's Secret War Against Bolshevism, this is the crux of what I argued. What am I talking about? Bolsheviks come to power in November 1917. Woodrow Wilson refuses to have diplomatic relations with the new Soviet government. In fact, the United States refuses to establish diplomatic relations with Soviet Russia until 1933. 1933, that's right. The British and the French and the Italians and the Germans all established diplomatic relations with Soviet Russia by 1924. But the Wilsonian precedent of refusing to shake hands with the bloody Bolsheviks who are immoral, Wilson refuses to have diplomatic relations with them. Instead, Wilson continues to maintain diplomatic relations with uh, Boris Bakhmetyev, Boris Bakhmetyev, 
who is the ambassador of the provisional government. The provisional government, as those of you and Professor Hartnett's of course, no. There's a government in power between February and October of 1917. So Bakhmetyev no longer represents a government that exists, but the United States continues to recognize him as the ambassador of the Russian people, as the representative of the kind of Russia that America wants to see, a return to democracy, a return to American-influenced development. So we continue to recognize the ambassador of the Persian government. So that's important in saying, this is what we stand for. This is what we want to see in Russia. We dis despise the Bolsheviks, and we refuse to have anything to do with them. But why is it important in practical terms that Wilson continues to maintain um, the ambassador? So the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C. continues to be controlled by Bakhmetyev. Why is that important? In practical terms, it's important. Why? Uh -huh. So if he admits that the Soviet Union was a nation, then he would also be forced by his own sort of logic to admit that they have a right to self-determination, right? That he was certainly so denied. Yeah, that's a good point. So that it has a political, ideological dimension. It, it means you establish diplomatic relations, mean you, you essentially accept that de facto they're in power, and maybe even you accept the legitimacy of the government. That's certainly the Wilsonian idea, that diplomatic relations doesn't just mean that you accept that they are in power. To Wilson, diplomatic relations mean we morally approve of the, of the government. And so Wilson will hold, will hold that. But there's also a practical reason. Wilson can use the embassy, the Russian embassy in Washington, D.C., as a channel for passing funding to anti-Bolshevik forces in the Russian Civil War because the Wilson administration had um, given the provisional government of Russia, the Kerensky government of 1917, $300 million worth of loans to buy American military equipment. They hadn't managed to use all $300 million in 1917. So the unexpunded funds, more than $100 million, could be used for other purposes without having to co go to Congress for a congressional appropriation, without having to go to Congress and say, well, we don't like the Bolsheviks. We do like the anti-Bolsheviks. How about it? Can you give us 50 or 100 million dollars to go fund the... Wilson doesn't have to go to Congress for that appropriation because the funds have already been appropriated for military purposes related to the war against Germany. They're just being held on the books. So this is a method of covert intervention. And it's not the only uh, um, um, method of covert intervention. Decided upon in the weeks after the Bolshevik seizure of power. In December 1917, Wilson also approves Robert Lansing's suggestion that the United States should pass uh, money to the British and the French, who would then turn around and give that money to anti-Bolshevik forces, Cossack forces, gathering in the south of Russia, a guy named uh, Kaledin, a guy named Kornilov in the south of Russia. So Wilson has a series of ways of trying to pass funding to anti-Bolshevik forces without saying publicly that that's what he was doing. Why wouldn't it? If you morally disapprove of the government, if you loathe them, you disapprove of them, you point rightly to their dispersal of the Constituent Assembly and say they have violated every, diplomat, every democratic principle. If you loathe the Bolsheviks that much, why not go public and say, we want to overthrow that government, so Congress, please appropriate funds for us to do it. Why, why not do it publicly and openly? Why not be honest, honest about it and just say, they're evil. It will be a blessing to them and to the future of the world if we overthrow the Bolshevik government today. Winston Churchill was prepared to say that. We should have suffocated the Bolshevik baby in its cradle. We should have gotten rid of that foul baboonery of Bolshevism, Winston Churchill. So Churchill campaigns for, we should have a big, massive intervention in Russia. Wilson doesn't do that. He can't do that. Why not? Yes. 
Well, even in 1918, when the, when the covert funding begins, he does, even before the war ends in November 1918, he's not willing to do that. We're making the world safe for democracy is the principle he's, he's explained. He said in the 14 points, we stand for the principle of self-determination and non-intervention. It would seem to be a contradiction of Wilsonian principles. Now, Wilson would not accept that. If you asked him, if we had him here today, <laughs> and you asked him, he said, no, it wouldn't be a violation because the Bolsheviks don't represent anybody. The Bolsheviks are a bunch of German agents and they're foul conspirators. They don't represent anybody. By intervening in the Russian Civil War, we would be restoring the Russian right of self-determination, not violating it. But that would be a complicated argument to make and it would be an argument you have to make at a time when many Americans actually thought the Bolsheviks were idealistic socialists who were doing something positive for Russia. So very complicated. There were socialists in the United States who had vo switched parties and voted for Wilson in the election of 1916, and Wilson did not want to antagonize and alienate some of the potential supporters of him because you know, in 1918, Wilson is still thinking, there was no uh, amendment barring him from running again. He's still thinking he's going to run in 1920. Yes? Did uh, the experience in Mexico weigh on him at all? Um, it's, an impor it's an important point. Um, he had the parallel clearly in mind. And he said, my policy with regard to Russia is precisely parallel to my policy with regard to Mexico. That is... I believe them in letting them wallow in anarchy and let them find their own way to salvation. That's what he said. That's not what he did in either case. So in the spring of 1914, uh, the United States seizes the port of Tampico in Mexico. In 1916, uh, per the Pershing expedition goes hundreds of miles inside Mexico. So there are two major interventions in the Mexican Civil War. Wilson did not just leave them to wallow in anarchy, and he did not leave the Russians to wallow in anarchy either. Another case where what he says in public does not match up with what he's doing in private. And what is the explanation for that? What I'm suggesting is, it's not just that he's a bald-faced hypocrite. He has a political dilemma. He wants to maintain faith that we are involved in an idealistic crusade to transform international relations for the better, to end all wars, to make the world safe for democracy, to give all peoples the right of self-determination. And he doesn't want to complicate that picture by trying to explain, oh, well, it's a very messy situation. There are whites and there are reds and there are greens and, uh, and we're going to support. He doesn't want to get involved in doing that. Yes? Well, and the whites are not very attractive. Yeah, and that's a, that's a point to emphasize because Wilson is very ambivalent about which anti-Bolshevik forces you're backing and how you're backing them. So when it comes to do we establish diplomatic relations with Admiral Kolchak in Siberia, uh, here we're talking about the Siberian intervention. Do we establish diplomatic, we, do we formally recognize Admiral Kolchak in 1919? Wilson comes right to the edge and he extracts from Kolchak a promise that there will be a democracy in Russia in the future and not just a, a, mon a monarchist organization or an authoritarian regime. So he remains attached to the idea, which I emphasized earlier in Professor Hartnett's class, he maintains attached, remains attached to the vision of a democratic Russia and doesn't go all the way in uh, wholeheartedly and openly backing the whites. So it gets, gets to be very complicated, even as he is providing in a variety of ways at a funding for the anti-Bolshevik forces. So you can do it indirectly, you can do it covertly, but Wilson doesn't want to do it openly and candidly. Uh, you can also get into, uh, one chapter of this book is about spies. Now Wilson said, <clears throat> in his April 1917 speech to Congress, that democracies are different from monarchies and autocracies. We don't put spies in neighboring republics and hatch the course of intrigue there. We don't do that. Democracies are inherently incapable of doing those dirty deeds that the European autocracies and monarchies do. But actually, in 1918, the United States did have an intelligence gathering operation inside Soviet Russia, run by uh, an American a businessman of Greek-Russian extraction named um, Kalamatiano. And the purpose of gathering the intelligence was to pass evidence about the Red Army order of battle 
to the forces that were intervening in northern Russia and eastern Siberia. That was at least one of the major purposes of the intelligence gathering or organization. And if you heard of Sidney Riley, Ace of Spies, that's what I'm talking about here because there was an American counterpart, Kalamatiano, inside the United States. <clears throat> so I said Kennan has one definition of intervention. Intervention is Eastern Siberia and Northern Russia, small military expeditions that were about the Germans. And what I'm suggesting to you is a different vision of intervention that involves multiple means of intervention. <clears throat> Here's an image that I found in the Hoover Institution archives in California many years ago drawn by a white Russian and anti-Bolshevik Russian at a time when he thought the Reds were destined to be crushed in the Russian Civil War. If you look at the map, which is on the back of your outline, if you look at the map, things don't look good for the Reds, do they? They're in tattered clothing. They're malnourished. Here they are just in the European heartland of Russia. They're surrounded. There are anti-Bolshevik forces in the south. There are anti-Bolshevik forces and British and French and American troops in the north at Arkhangelsk. The American cowboy is marching in from Siberia. You see this? Uh, the Poles are involved. The Finns are involved. They are surrounded. No way that Soviet Russia is going to survive. No way that the Reds are going to win the Russian Civil War. In 1918 and 1919, many Bolsheviks thought they were doomed. They were toast. So I'll come back to one legacy of that experience of being encircled in a moment. But the other thing that I want to finish up in talking about the legacy of intervention in the Russian Civil War is about undeclared wars. <clears throat> Chicago Tribune was a conservative Republican paper, anti-Bolshevik and anti-communist in orientation, as some of you well know. And yet in 1919, it's raising questions. What are our troops doing in frozen trenches in northern Russia months after the First World War is over? What are they doing there? The 339th Infantry Regiment, Detroit's own, had been sent into northern Russia. When those guys signed up and were trained in military camps, they thought, what were they thinking? We're going to go to France. We're going to be heroes. We're going to defeat the Germans. That's what they thought they were going to do. They're on ships on their way across the Atlantic. Change of plans. Go to England, re-outfitted with cold weather gear, and sent to northern Russia instead to intervene in, nor in northern Russia. They're never given a clear explanation for why they were there. Hence, by April 1919, after they had invo been involved in frontline combat against the Red Army, they're asking, what are we doing here? And their wives and sisters and brothers and f mothers and fathers are asking the same question and writing letters to their members of Congress who are then asking the Wilson administration the same question, which contributes to the pressure on the Wilson administration to bring those boys home from northern Russia, though the boys in eastern Siberia stay all the way until April 1920. So why, why is this significant? For critics in Congress, like Senator Hiram Johnson from California, for critics in Congress, this is a very important and very worrying development. If Woodrow Wilson, without getting an authorization from Congress, can, in conjunction with the British and the French, send American troops into northern Russia and eastern Siberia to do something that may be in the interest of the British and the French, with their imperialistic ambitions, but is not in the interest of the United States, that's a very dangerous sign of undemocratic use of force, unconstitutional use of force, on behalf of, who knows, some kind of imperialistic purposes, but not on behalf of American interests. That's a sign of a dangerous development for the future of a kind of a national security state that is going to usurp the traditional functions of uh, a Congress in an American democracy. So that's a worrying sign to Hiram Johnson and others who are critics of Wilson's intervention. And that points towards a long-term legacy in the United States because you know that in the 1950s, who was the director of Central Intelligence? Who was the director of CIA in the 1950s? Alan Dulles. Alan Dulles, right. And who's the Secretary of State? John Foster, John Foster Dulles, very good. What were they doing in 1918? 
earlier. When did they get their start in the diplomatic service? Alan Dulles in 1917, 1918 was a junior diplomat posted to Central Europe. His uncle, Robert Lansing, was the Secretary of State. That didn't hurt his getting a start in the diplomatic service. John Foster Dulles was working with the War Trade Board, which is in charge of, among other things, overseeing the shipments of supplies to the anti-Bolshevik forces in the Russian Civil War. Alan Dulles, as a junior diplomat, is witnessing development in Central, Central Europe, including the establishment of a Hungarian Soviet, a Hungarian Soviet-style government, a Bavarian Soviet-style government. He's seeing the spread of Bolshevism into Eastern Europe, and Alan Dulles thinks, like John Foster Dulles, they're like Winston Churchill. We should take action to, to stop this Bolshevik menace right now. But they also realize that Woodrow Wilson is hampered by being in what Woodrow Wilson called a whispering gallery. That is, that it's no longer like the Congress of Vienna. You can't just do diplomacy behind closed doors. Newspaper editors are watching. The news gets all out around the world. You have to be attentive to what's going to be the implication on, for public opinion and for Congress. Therefore, you can't do things overtly and directly, intervention. You need to do it quietly. So propaganda, covert action, secretive methods of intervention. This is one of the lessons that John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles learn in 1918 and 1919, which they will then remember in the late 1940s and 1950s when the United States moved to establish more formally a covert action capability with the Central Intelligence Agency. So that's, I said I wanted to talk about memories and legacies, that's one memory. On the other hand, there's another kind of memory or legacy, the experience of being surrounded. So I showed you one kind of map before, here's a different kind of map. Bolshevik Russia is surrounded by hostile forces. What's the imprint of that on Soviet memory? While we were surrounded, we were like a besieged fortress. So here, the red workers in the red factory area uh, are fighting off the attacking white forces in the Russian Civil War. They're trying to attack Petrograd, the, uh, the old capital uh, of Russia. There's a, so we're like a besieged fortress surrounded by hostile enemies. Uh, hostile enemies. Why is that important? because Soviet propaganda will constantly emphasize that theme going forward. So the covers of Crocodil, the illustrated communist publication, will emphasize, recalling 1917, this was the time when the USSR was surrounded by hostile enemies, not only the Americans and the British, but also the Japanese out in Siberia. We were surrounded, or, or go, jumping forward to 1937, the 20th anniversary of the Revolution of 1917. It's remembering the time of the Russian Civil War and how we were surrounded by enemies. Nonetheless, we survived. Nonetheless, the Reds won, even when we were facing the hostile encirclement. Here, the propagandist from 1949 reminds Soviet readers of, in 1918, Winston Churchill had tried to push the Americans towards a big intervention in the Russian Civil War. So there is a legacy, an imprint on the Soviet mindset that the, host, the uh, capitalist world is hostile to us, and they will try again, if they get an opportunity, to intervene in our internal affairs and to try to overthrow our government. So here, you see Churchill, you see the American. They're trying to get inside our fortress, so we need to keep the drawbridge up. We need to maintain tight control. This is an important part of the Soviet mentality. And it traces back to 1918. The Soviet propagandists repeatedly remind the Soviets of the precedent going back to 1918. Okay, uh, last major theme that I want to get at today. If I've talked about Soviet memories and Soviet perceptions and Soviet images, what about on the American side? This is from the time of the Red Scare in 1919. What's striking about this image? The stars and stripes, the American flag, and look at this figure. You can always tell a Bolshevik by his beard. An abundance of whiskers, that's the, that's the key. How do you know a red walking down the street? You can tell when they've got all of these whiskers. Now, this is the Bolshevik with a, with a knife, with the torch of anarchy. This is from a time of the Red Scare when there's a drive to put them out and keep them out, which is done quite physically. 
They're rounded up in the Palmerades. They're put on a ship to Buford and uh, ship, shipped back to Russia, shipped them back to Russia. Uh, Woodrow Wilson says at this time that Bolshevism represents the negation of everything American. It's not just a bad ideology. They represent the opposite of us in every respect. Anti-capitalist, anti-democratic, anti-religious, they are the opposite of us. So through the contrast of them, we affirm who we are. There will be a long, a long running legacy for this. Sometimes this is couched with an emphasis on religion, and it is Soviet atheism. Uh, the, the, uh, the context here in 1923 is the execution of a Catholic um, uh, priest in, in Russia. Uh, Soviet uh, atheism and sacrilege is contrasted to Western civilization. Light is contrasted against dark. The bloody Bolsheviks are contrasted with civilization. So what you find here is over and over again, an emphasis on they're dark, we're light. They're evil, we're good. In the class this afternoon, Professor Hardin's class, I made a point of showing how this idea is not new after 1917. Actually, the origins of this kind of treatment of Russia as the dark opposite of America go back to the Tsarist period. Already in 1903, from the time of the Kishinev pogrom, the riot against Jews, uh, in the southwestern part of Russia. Already in 1903, the American cartoonist here on the front page of the uh, Philadelphia Inquirer is depicting the Russian government as being like, who is that figure? The devil, the devil. Satan. The embodiment of evil in the modern world is with the Russian government. And what is our proper role? As the force of civilization, Lady, Lady Liberty, Miss Columbia, our proper role is to bring light to the dark places of the world, to bring uh, humanitarian relief to the suffering Jews in Russia. So my point is, this sort of idea in 1923 is not new. That's already uh, the idea of treating Russia as the dark opposite of light America is not new. But what, what happens after 1917 is the notion of Russia as the opposite of America becomes more pervasive and it becomes more politicized. So that in 1924, for example, Republicans use the specter of Red Revolution, the scarecrow of Red Revolution, in their political campaign by suggesting that <clears throat> not only the uh, Progressive Party candidate, Robert La Follette, but also even the Democrat, who is actually a conservative, fairly conservative Democrat, they are more sympathetic to the Bolsheviks. They are more sympathetic to the Reds. And you can trust us Republicans because we are safely conservative and pro-capitalist. So here's an exploitation of uh, the Bolshevik specter for domestic political purposes inside the United States. It's not just 1924. That's a theme that will run on in Soviet-American relations it, through much of the 20th century. So then in 1976, for example, this political cartoonist plays on the idea that uh, during the political campaign, at the end of the campaign against uh, Jimmy Carter, Gerald Ford had to try to say some nasty things about the Soviet Union, beat up on the effigy of the Soviet Union for domestic political purposes. So here Henry Kissinger is explaining to Leonid Brezhnev, oh, don't worry too much, it's just party politics. We'll get back to negotiating an arms agreement after the election is safely over. But my point is, uh, um, what's new in the Soviet period is these domestic po political implications are much more intense than they, than they were in the Tsarist period. And that's a theme that runs us up towards the present with the use of uh, Vladimir Putin's Russia as the foil for the affirmation of American virtues. So Woodrow Wilson said, Bolshevism represents the negation of everything in American. There are a lot of Americans today who would say Putin represents the opposite of every American virtue. Homophobic, repressive, uh, you go down the list. But you notice here he's depicted again with the Statue of Liberty, but in reverse. Uh, 
uh, and misleadingly uh, associating him back with the communist past with the hammer and, hammer and sickle, even though Putin is actually anti-communist in, in orientation. So my point is the post-Soviet legacy of Americans continuing to use Russia as a foil for affirming the superiority of the United States at a time when there are plenty of reasons to be worried about whether American, America really is so exceptionally virtuous all around the world. We have Edward Snowden's revelations. We remember what happened at Abu Ghraib in Iraq. We remember what happened at Guantanamo. You can go around the world. There are plenty of reasons for worrying about whether the United States really is the shining city upon a hill that John Winthrop said it should be. But if we emphasize how bloody and uh, atrocious and repressive Putin's Russia is, then we can deflect attention from some of our own domestic problems. And that's a story that has a long history. It goes back to 1903 and earlier, when to focus on the evil of Tsarist Russia had the effect of deflecting attention from evils inside the United States, such as the lynching of African Americans, the racial discrimination, which actually becomes more intense under Woodrow Wilson than it had been before. So my argument here has been about uh, a, a legacy of using the Russian other to affirm the superiority of America. So what have I been trying to do? I've been trying to set up a perspective on the present day, in, in part, that's what I'm ultimately leading towards, in which my recommendation would be, let's get away from these legacies of the past. Let's de-ideologize American-Russian relations. Putin is not a communist. Putin has no claim to offering what the Soviets offered, an alternative vision of the future of the world that we're going to lead everyone to. Putin is not, is not, is not saying that he's anti-capitalist or that there's some different vision that Russia is going to hold up for the modernization of the world. Uh, De-ideologizing -ide American-Russian relations would, I think, allow us to think more carefully, more coolly, more soberly about national interests and how as much as we disagree with the Russians about some things, there are some common interests that we have in the world, starting with counterterrorism operations. And to think soberly about where we can cooperate with the Russians, I think we need to cool the ideological antipathy. Um, second, I think we should move away from the belief that we Americans know what the proper destiny of Russia is and to be uh, open to letting the Russians decide what their future is. Uh, and then finally, I'm suggesting that we should try to get away from this highly emotional, highly charged treatment on both sides of the other country as a foil for the affirmation of that country's uh, national identity. Uh, that's a poisonous kind of dynamic where each side wants to affirm its superiority by knocking on, by denigrating the nature of the other country. And in saying that, I'm actually not saying anything terribly new. In saying that, I'm really just reproducing the wisdom that George F. Kennan came to later in his life. So that by the 1970s, and certainly by the 1990s, Kennan's basic wisdom was, Russians are never going to become like us. They have a very different history. They have a very different culture. They're a very different society. You should not envision the Americanization of Russia. Not in, a, not in a political, cultural sense, anyway. In terms of capitalist modernization, that's a, that's a different thing. And second, Kennan is suggesting that we should take on the, the idea that the problem is not just with them. The problem may also lie in the way that we think about our own role in the world. And so Kennan is urging Americans to get away from the messianic tradition that we know what's right, and we will go out around the world and tell you what's right. And we will work to remake your political system in our, in our own image. So George F. Kennan, who I'm, whom I used as a foil for the first two parts of the lecture, upholds the kind of wisdom that I think is applicable to the present day. So he died back in, I think, 2005 as a very old man. But I think what he came to late in life as a wisdom about American-Russian relations remains applicable today. Questions? Yes.
Uh huh. You talk about the legacy of Russia being surrounded and besieged. So it's a counterintuitive way because you almost say that in a way Wilson sort of succeeded in his objective of destroying the Russian Revolution just you know 50 years down the line rather than 20. No, um, uh, I, I understand your point. I think it's an important one, but Woodrow Wilson wouldn't wouldn't put it wouldn't put it that way. Uh, because Woodrow Wilson did not want to see uh, a militarized America. That was Wilson's nightmare vision. Part of his argument for the United States going into the League of Nations was in order to avoid a national security state, uh, a heavy permanent military establishment, a military industrial complex, that's what we'll have to have if we don't go into the League of Nations. If you look at Wilson's speeches from September 1919, when he goes around the country trying to sell U.S. entry into the League of Nations, that's one of the arguments that he makes. In order to remain in America that has a small permanent military establishment, we have to go into the League of Nations and be part of a collective security organization. So he didn't have a vision of let's bankrupt the Soviets by causing them to over overspend. Uh, uh, I do think that that is an important argument for what actually happens after 1945, that in the context of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization versus the Warsaw Pact and the two rival camps and both sides having nuclear weapons and heavily militarized spending and the Soviet Union having to devote much more of its gross national product to the military than the United States did because the U.S. has a larger pie, therefore it can spend a smaller proportion and still be exceeding the Soviets in technological capability. I do think that that is a part of the overstretch the overextension of the Soviet economy that contributes to its severe economic problems by the 1980s. But I, that's not, that was not part of Woodrow Wilson's vision. Uh, <clears throat> that was Dwight Eisenhower's nightmare on the American side, that we would spend so much on our military that we'd be, we would become financially bankrupt. That was Dwight Eisenhower's nightmare of where America might, might go. And, th uh, and uh, he tried to, to, to keep the spending down. To fully answer your question would, would, be, would be very complicated, where I think what gets to be more important in the 1980s are things like loss of faith in communism. So one of the things I tried to show is how there was faith in the superiority of, of communism as a productive system. We're going to surpass the Americans. There was faith, even in Khrushchev's period. Uh, you know, this is not just Soviet propaganda. There is a certain idealism in the Soviet public in the late 1950s. During the period of de-Stalinization, freer, freer discussion, Solzhenitsyn can get published. There is a certain idealism in that time, a, cer a certain belief in communism even then. That faith uh, uh, largely disappears by the, by the 1980s. That's important. Competition in terms of cultural production and coming to think that we want to watch Rambo. We want to watch Hollywood movies. We're tired of these Soviet, Soviet movies. That's another dimension. Uh, we want to wear blue jeans. We want to drink Coca-Cola. Uh, there's, a, there's a kind of cultural infiltration that is also important to the ending of the story. Uh, overextension in the war in Afghanistan in the 1980s and discrediting of the idea that the Soviet Union stands for peace when it is engaged in a bloody war in Afghanistan. All of those kinds of things figure, I think, in the overextension of the Soviet Union as much as what it was spending on the military. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to give you a break while uh, we're at, before uh, accepting more questions. But for now, I'd like just to solicit an expression of appreciation for what is, for me, a singular experience of, of listening to a presenter. And I'm hanging on every word. I don't think that's ever happened before. <laughs> and I thank you very much. So let us. <laughs> talking about uh, races, um, I, talking to her, I think you caught up and even passed Italian studies for packing this room. Yay. So uh, Russian studies is on the up. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce or, or acknowledge the presence of uh, Dean Adele Lindenmeyer of our Russian area studies uh, faculty, uh, Dr. Mark Schrod of our Russian area studies faculty, uh, uh, Lynn, Dr. Lynn Hardnett uh, of our Russian Area Studies faculty, and also acknowledge uh, with appreciation the presence of Mark, uh, Dr. Mark Pelicchio, the uh, chair of the history department. Uh, so uh, thank you for being here, and back to the floor for Dr. Pelicchio for more questions.
Okay. Yeah, if you, if you need to leave, go ahead, but I would be delighted to entertain other questions. Yes? So when we were, you were talking about the late 50s and the Soviet propaganda, it seemed like most of it was like based on, you said, farming uh, from the Soviet side. And mm -hmm. is it fair to say that the Americans at that time, our propaganda was more like a missile gap? Were the Soviets more focused on catching up economically, correct? Uh -huh. And was the whole military imbalance, even though it was kind of just a false claim, is that more of an American thing? Uh, that's, a, that's a big question. Our propaganda against them, they're atheistic and we're religious. So if you, if you, if you want to look at what is the content of what we're beaming into them through Voice of America broadcasts and Radio Liberty broadcasts, one of the things that we're beaming in is America is an example of a Christian country where there is religious freedom uh, in contrast to religious persecution there. We have human rights. Uh, they, they have persecution of Jews and, and others in, in Soviet Russia. Uh, people want to escape from their country, and people want to immigrate to our country. Uh, those, would be, those would be some of the themes. Then they would try to counter the, uh, the, propaganda, the Soviet propaganda about racism by sending African Americans around the world as jazz ambassadors, as Penny Vanessian has written about in, in a book. We will we'll show. We're not such terrible racists. Yeah, there's a Little Rock, Arkansas, and yes, we have a little problem there. But uh, look, uh, the genius of the American democratic system is it provides for the ca capacity of peaceful reform. So there can be a peaceful civil rights movement that can lead to results, you see, and then by 64, 65, we have the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act, and we can send Africa, Dizzy Gillespie and Louis Armstrong and others around the world to show the world that we have African Americans who are loyal patriotic Americans because they recognize that despite our past, we are moving forward to offering African Americans a, a brighter future. So those would be some of the key themes in, in American overt propaganda. I don't think those are the most effective ones. I think the most effective are having Americans actually physically present in the Soviet Union, educational exchange, cultural exchange, embodying a different mentality, a different way of life, open-mindedness, freedom, freedom of expression, and then, like I said before, blue jeans, Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, uh, movies, just a, 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 desi a desirable way of life manifested in a non-threatening form by Americans actually being, being physically present. That, I think, has a corrosive impact. Um, there's a, a scholar named uh, Yurchak, Alexei Yurchak. Everything was forever until it was no more, about the uh, unraveling of the Soviet system, right? Where he writes about this process where you could be a good um, a member of the Komsomol, an idealistic believer that Lenin had the right vision and that's the way we should go. You could be a communist, a young idealistic communist, and still love your Marlboro cigarettes and your Coca-Cola and your jazz mu music or your rock and roll records. Those things could coexist. But what is the long-term effect of having that sort of double consciousness of being, I'm a good communist, but I smoke Marlboros and I, and I drink Coke. There's a long-term effect. It's like, you know, the way I think of it is like a termite. Uh, I, I, and working on the, on the foundations of a building. So why everything was forever until it was, until it was no more. I think that's, that's part of the explanation there. Yes? Could we go uh, back to 1918, 1919 yeah. and the intervention? Yeah. Uh, and you uh, mentioned briefly the ARA yep. and the American Red Cross. And so I, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the use by the U.S. of uh, what we would call NGOs today, uh -huh. or maybe not entirely in right. NGOs, uh, and, and using them as instruments of intervention. Uh -huh. uh, so um, let's talk about the Red Cross. Uh -huh. What were they really doing in, in Russia? Well, that's, 1918, that's, co that's complicated. So on the one hand, you have people like Raymond Robbins who work in uh, 1917 to try to collaborate with socialist, members of the Socialist Revolutionary Party who are really moderate socialists, uh, Breshko Breshkovskaya in, in particular, uh, to, on a propaganda campaign to encourage uh, 
America is coming into the war. America is an admirable, productive democracy. The, the, that's one of the things that the American Cross mission is doing. And that's funded by, not the U.S. government, this is where you get into the end but not quite end part of, part of your, your question, uh, William Boyce Thompson, who is the head of the American Red Cross mission, who is a very wealthy man and donates a million dollars to fund this propaganda campaign. Why? Keep Russia in the war, keep the Bolsheviks from taking power. That's one thing that the Red Cross That's does. That's in 1917. That's in 1917. Then the Bolsheviks are in power. And then Robbins very pragmatically says, well, we tried to keep the Bolsheviks from coming to power, but by God, they are in power. So now we have to deal with the reality. And so Robbins, unlike, uh, unlike the official diplomatic corps, Robbins, as an informal American representative, is able to go see Trotsky, is able to meet with Lenin, and Robbins uh, becomes convinced that it is possible for us to work together. Uh, so uh, I, I mentioned Robbins' meeting with Lenin with regard to the um, idea of a, uh, a trade relationship. Robbins also thinks in February, March 1918, before the signing of the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, that he and Trotsky can work out an arrangement where if the Russians will not sign the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, the Americans can provide military assistance to the Soviets to try to rebuild their armed forces and resist the Germans. So Robbins, uh, didn't want the Bolsheviks to come to power. Once they are in power, he starts to pragmatically deal with the situation on the ground and how can it serve America's military strategic interests and America's economic interests to develop a relationship with the Soviet side. While the war is still going on. While the war is still going on. Then Robbins comes back to the United States after May 1918 and becomes one of the leading critics of Wilson's intervention in the Russian Civil War. So that's a bit about, uh, about, the, about the Red Cross. Uh, the, um, the American Relief Administration, ARA, is more formally a government agency during the war. It becomes nominally private, but with Herbert Hoover as, still as its director while he's simultaneously Secretary of Commerce. Uh, and in 1921, they go to actually providing famine relief aid, as you know, inside Soviet Russia. But before that, in the period of the Russian Civil War in 1919 and 1920, uh, they have withheld providing assistance to Bolshevik occupied territory. The ARA goes in to the Baltic states, the ARA is active in Siberia, the ARA is involved in northern Russia supporting the white forces. Uh, we'll help them with uh, flour, bacon, uh, condensed milk, uh, clothing, we'll help them. But we're not going into Soviet occupied territory until it is liberated. If General Yudenich had succeeded in capturing Petrograd, following Yudenich's forces into Petrograd would have been American Relief Administration officers in 1919. So that's, that's uh, ARA. Then you could talk about YMCA and the way that YMCA was doing its war work wh wherever it could. But it didn't work inside Soviet Russia after, you know, 19, at the height of the Civil War. It did work around the periphery. And there's some interesting stories there where some YMCA officials were quite critical of the U.S. role. There's a guy named Ralph Albright who writes a book, Fighting Without a War, about what he observed in northern Russia, uh, where the United States is backing what he regards as some really unsavory characters in the north who don't match up with what he envisions as what the United States should be doing. So these organizations, including the IRA, but also the and the YMCA, they need to be very agile in this period because they have one set of objectives and modus operandi, and then the military situation changes. There's an armistice. The, the uh, <coughs> fortunes of the Civil War shift back and forth, and and so it's it's quite. <coughs> me, I, I'm speculating that they they need to change their mission more than once uh, between 1917 before October. And they need to change their tactics. <clears throat> They need to change their tactics, but the mission could remain the same. So American Relief Administration in 1921, the original idea for this comes from John Spargo, an anti-Bolshevik socialist, uh, and, <clears throat> and the idea, as uh, Bertrand Patnaud has shown in a book called uh, The Big Show in Bololand, a huge fat book that a uh, Hoover Institution backed, uh, he shows that the idea for the ARA mission into Soviet Russia in 1921 is we'll kill them with kindness. Uh, we'll uh, show that we Americans can do what the Soviet government can't do. Provide famine relief administration, famine relief, to millions of starving Russians and use as our agents in the ARA relief distribution 
the very old elites that the Bolsheviks want to see, the old people, they want, they want to see them buried in the past. But the Americans will come in and use those very people to provide the family and therefore keep those people alive and keep hope alive for a non-Bolshevik. Uh, government. So there's a complicated story there where Lenin is onto this right from the start and says, Cheka, you, <laughs> you watch these people because I'm suspicious about what, what they're up to. And he's absol absolutely right. That is the ultimate ambition of the a ARA Relief Administration. It's still a good work. It still saves millions of, of, of Russian lives. But there is an ulterior political mission in mind from the outset. Yes, in the back. Yes. What were the mechanics of that? The Americans were not investing, per se, were they? Some Americans did invest. So I mentioned Averill Harriman investing in a manganese mining concession in the South. So it's complicated. How do you, how do you work that out? How do you, how do you get your money out? Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's a complicated story. But yes, uh, there, is a, there is financial investment, and that's very important to the Soviets. That's a, that's a very important story. Because uh, wh why is there a forced collectivization of agriculture? You, you have to have primitive socialist accumulation of capital to finance industrialization if you're not getting enough in the way of loans and credits and financial investment from outside the country. Then you have to seize the grain to sell the grain on the world market and so on. So that question of investment is, re is, really, is really critical. So people couldn't make money. Well, Ford felt that he, was, he found a way to make sufficient money. And American companies that consulted on building Magnitogorsk, the, uh, the steel facility, uh, felt that they were getting, uh, getting money. Uh, the uh, hundreds of American engineers who went in during the first five-year plan, they got paid. They th felt they got paid pretty nicely, considering that there were, there were not enough jobs for them in the United States in the period of the Great Depression. So people were getting paid, but the mechanisms for how you worked it out were just a little complicated. I mean, you ad advance forward in time, think about uh, Pepsi wanted very much to get into the Soviet market as early as 1959, when they make it a point that at the kitchen debate in 1959, Khrushchev can, can sip a, a cup of Pepsi. But Pepsi does not get into the Soviet market until the early 1970s, when finally they get a deal to bottle Pepsi inside the Soviet Union. How do they get their money out? They can't get it directly. They get vodka, and they can sell vodka on the American market in return for having the, uh, the Pepsi bottling plants to produce the syrup and inside the Soviet Union. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so it's complicated, but they did get their, did they get their money out. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Patrick. You mentioned one of the things you talked about is, is you know, the, the picture of the cows and the milk, right? You talked yep. about this very hyper-materialistic sort of conception of Soviet success. Yes. When did the, because I mean, if you read Lenin, right, you know, on imperialism and things, that's not the kind of communism he's advocating. When do you, what provokes, and do you think the U.S. intervention had a role in provoking this turn to a sort of, you know, this sort of Soviet conception of scientific socialism that was so, it ended up being so hopelessly counterproductive? Um, Sorry, I'm not asking you. Yeah. Well, the first part, you're saying uh, Lenin's conception was not materialist? Well, it wasn't that it was not materialist. Uh -huh. It's that it was um, not consumerist. What's that? Not consumerist. Not consumerist. And more, exactly. more it, wasn't, it wasn't sort of slavishly devoted to this idea of like production quotas. Mm. It, is pr it is productivist. Productivist. It is productivist. But it's not dialectical. Mm -hmm. Never mind, I've completely lost the thread, forgive me. Um, That's all right, you, you, I'm, I'm sure you're theoretically much more sophisticated than I am. I don't, I don't think I could follow you there in, into that field. But there is, there is a material element. It, it becomes much more pronounced in the post-1945 period, where... The original objective was prosperity. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The idea was you know, peace, bread, and, you know, or was it bread, peace, and land? Bread, land, and peace. Yeah, but in the 1920s, there is a, there, you know, there is a kind of idealism about 
who the new Soviet man is going to be. And it's not just a money-grubbing uh, materialist. The standard is not just uh, you'll have more meat and milk on your table. It's, it's about, as one of my colleague Jochen Helbeck has written about uh, in, in, in his first book, uh, you, almost like a religion, you believe that you need to transform yourself. You need to become spiritually a better person, more dedicated to the welfare of the whole of the society. It, it, the emphasis is on what you're going to contribute, not on uh, what, do I, what do I get. I mean, there's all kinds of propaganda in the form of net men, you know, new mm -hmm. economic plan men, you know, people who weren't carpet baggers, you know, who went around making money. Right. So that's another, that's another way of we're, we're going to get to where we want to go by going through a period of, cap, of capitalist development. But at the same time, you see, that was, sort of, that was sort of the central tension of the Bolshevik Party. They were against the Mensheviks who argued that in order to get to communism, you had to go through this period of sort of capitalist mm -hmm. Yeah, so Lenin's, Lenin's basic decision in 1929 is, uh, 1921 is we were over-optimistic. We thought we could compress time more than you actually can. So now for a certain period of time, we're not sure how long, we'll have to take a, a step back in order to take more steps forward in the, in the future. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. My pleasure. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.